one. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Dugout Talk. As always, uh, you're joined by us here. Um, believe it or not, I guess we never really told the people where we are. We're actually like half the country away from each other. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, at least a two days. If you're taking a road trip, it's a two days drive. Yeah. Yeah, Pennsylvania, flying. Colorado. If you're yeah. flying, it's at least five hours. <laughs> but today, today's very, very special news for you guys. Today is spring training day. Yes, it is. Pitchers, pitchers and catchers are reporting uh, various teams around the league. Uh, we've got we've got spring training uh, in the air. Uh, we, if you think about it, we technically won't have to deal with another day uh, without any sort of baseball activity being played until November. So like I I had to throw on I've got my my Andrew McCutcheon jersey. Oh very nice. Yankees. Yep. Um the had to throw the cutch on. Uh just I'm just super excited. I saw you have a, a D back shirt on yeah, there. Yeah I've got a, a David Peralta t shirt. Oh okay. I'm uh okay. I've got a jersey but I'm sporting that one for uh when we cover the Diamondbacks so it's uh staying safe so then I don't spill anything on it. Yeah yeah all right so like I like we mentioned today is officially baseball season. Uh if you wanna you know technically I know some teams still aren't reporting yet. Um for the Yankees they are reporting today. Um, I'll get the list of, of non-roster invites out later today um, in case there are any Yankee fans that want to look at it. Um, but with that said, uh, we'll jump into some baseball history. Uh, speaking of Yankee news, today in 1990, which would be 31 years ago already, uh, Herb Rayborn, who was the Yankees director of Latin American operations, he signed um, just an amateur free agent. Uh, you know, a guy, I believe out of Puerto Rico, um, he was, he was young. He was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was really, really lanky, really skinny. Um, didn't, didn't really, didn't really have like a baseball build, uh, for the kind of guys you were seeing in the league at the time. He was just 20 years old. Um, the scouts said that he had an effortless pitching motion, uh, less than average fastball signed up to about a $3,000 contract. Uh, safe to say, you know, you fast forward 31 years later and he's, uh, the, the only unanimous hall of famer, uh, of all time. Uh, I, b- I believe he pitched for something like 28, 20, 22, 23 years, something like that. It was just a crazy amount of time, um, saves leader, uh, no formal training as a pitcher, as you can see there on the screen. Um, and just, you know. Just like that, you know, you never really know who you're going to find out there in the, the world. So, like I said, today in 1990, the best relief pitcher of all time was signed uh, to the Yankees. Those guys that you just kind of come across, uh, they tend to be, they tend, they tend to turn out to be a lot better products than some of those really highly touted guys yeah. out of high school and college. I think of uh, that movie with Clint Eastwood, Trouble with the Curve. Yep. They, uh, they, found the, they found Peanut Boy who could mm-hmm. throw a nasty slider with a, as a lefty and a breaking ball. And he was making their number one, the Braves number one pick yep. look like a fool out there. Um, oh, Gentry. Yeah. Grant. I mean, granted, we never saw what hat, what came of it, but just goes yeah. to show you never know what you're going to come for when you're, you're what you're going to come across. Uh, my day in history happened 45 years ago today in 1976. So this one's a little unique uh, major former major league pitcher, Mike Scott, at the time of Pepperdine University, a smaller university in Southern California, pitched a perfect game against California Lutheran University, winning three to nothing. He would be selected in the second round by the New York Mets of the MLB draft that June. Scott would go on to pitch for 13 years from 1979 to 1999, 1991 going 124 and 108 with a 3.54 ERA in 2068 innings pitched. Um, now get this before he was very, he was pretty mediocre with the Mets. Um, I don't have his exact numbers, but he wasn't really anything all that stellar for them. Mm-hmm. Um, Mets fans probably don't even remember him, but he got traded or he signed, he either got traded or got signed by the Astros in the mid eighties. And in 1986 with the Houston Astros, he led MLB with 306 strikeouts. 
Now, before that, he never had a season where he recorded more than 140 strikeouts. Wow. So he jumped from one, he jumped from like 135 to 306 overnight. <laughs> and he would finish with 1,469 in his career. Uh, wow. 1986, he also recorded a 2.22 ERA, which led Major League Baseball as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of one of those unique ones, ones that I don't think people think about all too much. But uh, if you're, if you're a Mike Scott fan out there, there you go. Um, that's that's my little day in history for all you. Kind of a common trend with how the Mets were back in the 60s and 70s. You know, I mean, you look at guys like uh, Nolan Ryan, uh, Tom Seaver, uh, Mike Scott, you can add to that list, who kind of found new life after they left the Mets. Um, not not to say that they weren't good pitchers with the Mets, but um, you know they they went and found uh, success somewhere else. Mike Scott, three hundred six strikeouts, fourteen sixty nine in his career. That's like a fifth. He had like a fifth yeah. of his career strikeouts in one season. In one season, yeah, that's Man. that's unreal. All right, so today Cincinnati Reds, uh, some of their twenty twenty off season additions and subtractions. Um, you look at some of the additions that they had. One of my favorite players, uh, my close friend's favorite player, D. Gordon. I know he goes by D. Strange Gordon nowadays uh, in honor of his mother. Um, they, he was an offseason addition for them. I, I, hope that he, I hope that he can really uh, kind of turn it on. Uh, Dwight Smith Jr., Jeff Hoffman, No Ramirez, uh, Cam Bedrosian, who actually just signed yesterday. Um, and Sean Doolittle, who, you know, was with the 2019 Nationals World Series team. Uh, so a decent amount of additions. You look at some of their attractions. Uh, Freddie Galvis, the middle infielder. Kirk Casale, the catcher. Uh, Brian Goodwin, the outfielder. Matt Davidson, who I think just signed with the, the Dodgers yesterday. Yep. yep. Um, the kind of a third base. When I remember he, when he was with the, the White Sox, he was kind of known as a, a good power hitter back there. Um, Phil Irvin, uh, obviously the Cy Young winner, Trevor Bauer went to the Dodgers, um, former, uh, Diamondbacks closer setup man, Archie Bradley. Uh, he left in free agency. He went to sign with Philadelphia, Rizal Iglesias. I believe they traded him. No, I think he went in free agency to, uh, the angels. Uh, and then Nate Jones, who was uh, a longtime White Sox, he is also a, a subtraction from their offseason. How do you how do you kind of round out? It seems like they went kind of side to side rather than forward or backwards. Yeah, um, it's kind of it's kind of troubling to me because it felt like last year the Reds really had something there. Um, it felt like they were a team capable of winning the division, getting off to a really strong like using taking advantage of a 60 game schedule and making the most of it mm -hmm. but um, they had a lot of ups and downs they barely made it into the playoffs um you know i'm not really sure what is going through the reds heads right now i know they no longer have dick williams as the gm he just abruptly stepped down um after last season um it's kind of yeah, I'm not really sure how I feel about the Reds. I was really hyped on them last year. This year, it kind of feels like they've taken a step back. And mm -hmm. um, sure, they still have a pretty decent offense, but it kind of feels like also they're realizing that with the contracts they signed with Castellanos and Moustakis, mm -hmm. um, it may seem like to them they can't afford to sign some of these guys, hence why Trevor Bauer walked. Hence why Archie mm -hmm. Bradley walked. Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure kind of what's what's up with the Reds. Um, I'm, I think that I'm probably the most disappointed in how their off season has gone. Really, mm -hmm. just with some of these additions, I know they have been bolstering up the bullpen, which I think is a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. But they still, I feel like this is a team that should have tried to do a lot more. Um, they, they should have done more to at least keep that core together. Uh, granted, I don't think they would have been able to bring Bauer back no matter what. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know he only signed a three-year deal with the Dodgers, but he got a heck of a lot of money from them. I, I didn't think it was really possible unless if he was really commitment on committed mm -hmm. on going on one-year deals. I don't think the Reds would have been able to bring him back, but they could have brought Archie back in my opinion. 
Um, and they probably could have kept Rizal Iglesias around. I think he I think he was traded to the Angels. I just don't remember how the trade, what the trade yeah. was. Uh, I know he went there though. Yeah, I think I think they could have done a lot more to try and keep this group of guys together. But it's like we've been saying this week, the NL Central is very much up for grabs, so it may not really make that big a difference for them either. Mm-hmm. Um, they could still they could still go out and surprise a lot of people this season and be a competitive team. But just kind of looking at what what's happened, other than improving the bullpen, there's there's not it's not as impressive of a team as it was in 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think thankfully for them outside of the outside of the Cardinals, none of their immediate competition has gotten incredibly better either. Right. Um, there, there's a very good chance that this team could almost sleepwalk into, into second place. Um, just looking at some of their numbers from last season. Um, obviously, as, as we mentioned, they finished 31 and 29. They finished what was really crazy to think was like this this team was always it's always kind of going to be a power first team with Castellanos and Moustakis and and, um, even Joey Votto here in his later years still has some pop they finished yeah yeah Suarez as well Um, they finished dead last in the NL Central in hits with 390 and they finished dead last in the NL on average with 212 a 212 batting average for your whole team Um, I didn't look into the specifics um, but like I mentioned, they did finish first in the NL in home runs with 90. Um, so kind of, you know, I think that they're probably trying to address some of their uh, all or nothing men, you know, uh, kind of uh, mentality going into this year with a signing like D Gordon. Uh, um, to be honest, I actually forgot that he went there. Um, so I don't actually have him in my starting lineup. I probably would if I would have, if I would have looked closer um, I actually have a surprise guy in my lineup that we'll show you here in a second. But yeah, it, it does seem like they are, are kind of handcuffing themselves um, by letting the Moustakis and Castellano contracts um, kind of get them down. Yeah, um, the the hit and miss mentality, you bring a good point up about that. The fact that they finished dead last in offense makes it mm-hmm. that much more impressive that they made the playoffs last year. Yeah. But they also got yeah. shut out in both the wild card games. So yeah. um I think it just goes to show you can't live and die on the home run ball. You you just can't. Um you can't. Nope. I know that like people who watch from a distance, they they like to see the home runs. I'm a I'm a sucker for homers too. I like Absolutely. to see them. Absolutely. But you cannot live and die by the long ball. Um because you're gonna die by the long ball before you live with it. So uh, and the Reds pretty much proved that in the short season last year, which explains a lot as to why they only went 30 and 31 and 29. They could have definitely yeah. had a better season um, had they had a little more balance in that lineup. Speaking of someone who lived and died by the home run ball, um, yesterday in 2017, um, the the Yankees signed Chris Carter. Remember Chris Carter uh, with the Astros <laughs> and the Braves? That dude, that dude was all or nothing. Yeah, he well. really he was. Had, he had he had lighthouse. Uh, I call him. I called it lighthouse tower power. So when he hit a home run, <laughs> it was the Chris Carter lighthouse tower power hour. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of I watched some of his highlights, and man, that dude just had an effortless swing. He really um, did. Sent balls flying, but he also hit like two twenty in his career, and is has been in the minor leagues. I think in the twin system still the last couple seasons. Um, we'll, we'll stop, uh, dwelling on this. We'll kind of go to their, uh, their lineup. Uh, obviously the one name that stands out here, their shortstop, I'll get to him in a moment. Um, I'll start at the top with Shogo Akayama as the center fielder. Uh, I still have super high hopes for Shogo. Uh, he's, I think he's going to be, I think he can turn into a really elite hitter, uh, for this lineup and can be a, a great, uh, on base guy for them. I have Nicholas Castellanos. Uh, I know sometimes he likes to go by Nick um, after he left the, the Tigers. Uh, I still I still know him first as Nicholas. So I have him in right field. I have Joey Votto at the first base. Um, he, he figures to still just be Joey Votto. Uh, if he's not going to hit a line drive base hit, he's going to walk or he's going to hit a home run. The man gets on base in his sleep. I think he could go up there without a bat um, and, and get on base somehow. Uh, so that's enough said about him. Uh, in the cleanup role, I have the third baseman, Eugenio Suarez. 
Uh, Mike Moustakis batting fifth, batting sixth, the left fielder, Jesse Winker. And then the shortstop, I, I thought about, uh, I thought about going with someone else, but I, I really do think that the, it's going to come down to uh, Kyle Holder or D Gordon. I know that D Gordon has played more games in center field and has played more games at, at second base in his career. Um, but he, he has played shortstop. He played shortstop sometimes with the Marlins, sometimes with the Dodgers. Um, and had I had I looked closer and saw that D Gordon was on the team, I would have just slotted him in at shortstop. Um, I thought shortstop was probably going to be their weak point. Um, I think if D Gordon can win that job, um, then I think that that could actually be a strong suit. And I probably would, I probably would even move him up to um, first in the lineup. And then I have the switch hitting catcher, Tucker Barnhart uh, hitting eighth, and then the pitcher slot rounding it out. Yeah, you, I think. Do you real question? Do you know if if team if NL teams still? I know there for a couple of years ago they they kind of toyed around with like having the pitcher hit eighth. Do do teams still do that? Well, I mean the DH last year obviously they didn't, but I know yeah. Joe Madden's Cubs were the most notorious team for doing it, um, and it does happen on occasion. I okay. I've never actually been to a ball game personally where I've seen it happen, but I mean, Mm -hmm. I've watched plenty of games on TV where NL managers will use the pitcher in the eighth spot. Um, Outside of Joe Madden though, I haven't really seen it nearly as much. Um, I know it was kind of a fad there like three, four years ago. I didn't know if it materialized into something NL teams do on a regular or not. Yeah, I don't see it too. I don't see it all that often anymore. I mean, I still see it, just not. Mm-hmm. I, I guess it's not as consistent. Um, okay. I guess it just depends on who's the who the pitcher is too. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, there are some pitchers I can rake in this league, but yeah. um, like a guy on this team. Yeah. Uh, so my my lineup, I actually have my shortstop position a little surprising as well. Yeah, I, uh, I have I have Kyle Farmer as a shortstop. He was a former Dodgers uh, farmhand. He got Mm -hmm. traded along with Yasiel Puig a couple years ago uh, to the Reds. I think Farmer, this could be a year where he really shows what he's capable of. He hasn't really been able to put that full season together yet. Um, I think he's going to be the opening day shortstop. I think he's going to be the guy that the Reds go with on an everyday basis for the most part. Um, D Gordon will be a good bench bench piece for them in that, in that shortstop position as well. But I think that farmer is going to be their guy. Uh, so I got him hit, hitting lead off Joey Votto at first base, hitting second uh, Votto is definitely not the same hitter. He was even as recently as yeah. Um So I, but he, like you said, he can still get on base. He, you know, he's still good for that. Even if the bat starts to regress a little bit, um, I'm hoping that Votto can have somewhat of a breakout year again this year. Um, it doesn't really seem like you're watching vintage Votto when mm-hmm. not really hitting the ball. So I've got him still up at the top of the order though. Eugenio Suarez at third base, the power, the power hitter got him hitting third. I've got Mike Moustakis at second base hitting fourth uh, I put Nicholas Castellanos in the middle of the order in right field. Um, and I know he's capable of hitting a little higher in the lineup, but I think Castellanos is more of an RBI's guy or RBI guy. Um, I think putting him in the middle of the order, he'll be able to get runs home more easier that way. Um, and also provide a little pop in the middle of the order. Jesse Winker, I've got him in left field hitting sixth. Nick Senzel, the center fielder, I have him hitting seventh. And um, the thing about Senzel is he has not really lived up to expectations this early in his career so far. Um, kind of makes you wonder if they should have traded him to the Indians uh, a couple years ago. I know Cleveland was really high on Senzel and they wanted to bring him it wanted to bring him in in a trade and the Reds were basically making him untouchable. It kind yeah. of makes me wonder if the Reds should have actually accepted that offer. I don't remember what, who all was involved in the trade. I, just, I don't either. I just know that Senzel was part of that. Um, I think this could be a year where Senzel needs to prove that he should be in the lineup. Otherwise he's probably going to get benched mm-hmm. um, or even sent down to AAA one or the other. 
uh, Tucker Barnhart, the switch inning catcher. I've got him hitting eighth, and then I got the pitcher spot ninth. Yeah, it looks like a really nice, uh, well-rounded lineup. Uh, really only just outside of uh, Farmer and Senzel, I think we both agree that uh, this is probably going to be how their lineup is going to look on opening day, uh, assuming that they don't go out and, and, you know, pick a guy up. Right. Yeah. I mean, Shogo Akiyama could easily be in the lineup as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the Reds are actually pretty well balanced between righty and they lefty. Are. They're not really heavily favored on one side of the bo- one side of the box or the other, uh, mm-hmm. which that's a nice thing to have. And even some it of their is. lefties can hit left-handed pitching too. So mm-hmm. um, it's not like this is a lineup that you can just m- kind of do matchup yep. matchups against. Uh, you got to throw everybody out there and have them do the best they can, which that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have. Uh, Absolutely. Most definitely. All right. Taking a look at their rotation. Um, looks like we have the exact same one. Um, I've got, I've got Sonny Gray uh, now that uh, the Reds are in the, the post Trevor Bauer era. Um, he figures to probably be their, their ACE. Uh, I have Luis Castillo as the number two. I know it's possible, you know, as you, as yours looks there, um, it is possible that he could take over the number one spot. I just think, I'm willing to give Stunny Gray the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to give him the opportunity to uh, lock down the number one, one role. Uh, Tyler Maley, I have him as the number three. The veteran Wade Miley, I have him as the number four. And as we mentioned, uh, uh, the pitcher that can hit, Michael Lorenzen, I have him as the the number five hit, or pitcher for them. Yeah, like you said, I've got the same guys in my rotation. Um I think I could easily see Sonny Gray being the number one guy. Uh, but to me, Luis Castillo is just a little better than, mm-hmm. than Sonny Gray. And Gray has had a nice resurgence in Cincinnati, which has been really good to see, um, considering how hitter-friendly Great American Ballpark is. Um, it has been nice to see that Sonny has been able to find himself again. Um, but Luis Castillo, he was in Cy Young Talks not too long ago. Was, and even last year, he still put up – he still put up a really good season in a short stint. I think this is the guy, at least if I'm David Bell, I'd want to go with to start the year to kind of make a, make a statement. Um, I think your opening day pitch or whoever it is makes a statement into what your season, what you want in your season. And for me, having a guy like Luis Castillo on the mound on opening day shows that the Reds are not messing around. They are, they're in it to win it. They're in it to get a good start to the season. Uh, and to me, Castillo can kind of provide that a little more than Sonny Gray can. Uh, but mm-hmm. Gray is a solid number two oh, solid. in that rotation. That's a good one, too, punch they can have. Uh, Tyler Molly, I want to kind of talk about him real quick. Molly has been kind of up and down. Um, I'm not, I didn't look at his exact numbers going in, but I know he's been with the team for a few years now. He hasn't. Uh, he's kind of been in and out of the bullpen, triple A, the rotation. Um, but I think this year could be um, – this could be a statement year for Tyler Molly. I think he could have – he's capable of putting up a pretty big a pretty big year. Um, he could be a solid number three in that rotation if things go well for him. Um, and I think he's got the experience now where if he can just put all the pieces together, he could surprise a lot of people – um, and kind of fly under the radar at the same time. Uh, Wade Miley, I, he's been all everywhere. over the place. He's been yep. he's been everywhere since his time in Arizona. Um, he just hasn't been able to really find a home. He's had a lot of struggles on and off. He kind of found himself in Milwaukee not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I I'm not really sure how things are going to look for him at Great American. I guess we'll see when the season starts. Um, and then Michael Lorenzen, I'm kind of curious to see if they're going to make him a two-way player. Um, they, I know they were kind of talking about that, uh, in 2019, making him an outfielder at times for games. Um, this guy can hit though. Like you said, he, he does have a very solid bat on his shoulders. Um, I would argue he might be a better hitter than he is a pitcher. Uh, that's just my personal opinion, though. He hasn't – and he's kind of been the same as Molly. He's been in and out between rotation and bullpen. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I'm i excited to see if he can actually live up to the hype on the mound. But I'm also curious to see if they're going to – if the Reds are going to use him as a two-way player and try to actually put him 
out in the field every once in a while, um, especially if he does carry a good bat on him. I don't see why they couldn't do that a little bit. I know one common thing, and I haven't, even though I haven't seen it nearly as much where pitchers hit eighth in the lineup, it, we have mm-hmm. seen it where pitchers will pinch hit. Um, yep. You know, we've, we've seen managers go with some pitchers before they go to their bench, like uh, Bruce Bochy did it with Madison Bumgarner for years. Went to him on the bench. Uh, I know Joe Madden did it with Jake Arrieta. Um, Michael Lorenzen's even done it a little bit. So this could be a guy that you see easily coming off the bench to get that big hit for them if they absolutely need it. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is pretty middle of the middle of the road kind of rotation. Um, I like Castillo and Gray at the top. Molly Miley and uh, Lorenzen. Um, I think they're capable of being good, but I think this is an area if the Reds are in good position come trade deadline, they will probably need to, they will need to upgrade the rotation to some degree um, Mm -hmm. through through any kind of trade. Um, Who knows, maybe if they can convince a free agent starter to take a a smaller deal, uh, maybe they can bring someone in as a reinforcement like Jake Odorizzi or Taiwan Walker even. Yeah. who knows? I think I think this rotation will need to hold its own. If the Reds are going to stay competitive, this is going to be the one area that they absolutely need production from, and they need these guys to, to come through for them if they're mm-hmm. going to expect to compete this year. Yeah, I, I was actually just going to bring up um, Jake Odorizzi. Yeah, he would be, he would be ideal for them. Um, I know he's looking for a multi-year deal. I know that Taiwan Walker said – uh, rumors are coming out that he's looking for a multi-year deal at at least 10 million a year. Um, so we'll see if, if, uh, if the Reds decide to make one more splash to kind of shore up that rotation. Looking at their bullpen, um, I actually tried to set mine up um, it, kind of in order uh, as far as closer down to, down to more of a long relief role. Um, I like Amir Gare to be their closer. I know Sean Doolittle has way more experience as a closer than Amir Garrett, um, but I think they like Amir Garrett as their closer. I think they're confident in him. Um, I, I was I was a big fan of Amir Garrett when he was still in the minors um, a couple years ago. I thought he was gonna. I thought he had the potential to be a really great uh, left-handed starter for them. That didn't really work out. He had some really inflated numbers as a starter. Then he moved over to the bullpen and he started, he started striking dudes out um, essentially at ease um, and at will. So I like him as the, this, the closer, at least entering opening day. Um, it is possible that if Sean Doodle do little either outperforms him or Garrett underperforms, um, it is possible they could flip flop. Uh, I like Jeff Hoffman to be uh, more of a middle relief uh, kind of a, yeah, like I said, like a middle relief guy. Um, same with with Noah Ramirez, Cam Bedrosian, uh, TJ Antoine, uh, Sal Romano, and then I like Jose De Leon uh, to be. If you know Jose De Leon, once upon a time was was one of those highly touted uh, Dodgers pitching prospects. Um, found his way to Tampa Bay. Uh, did that didn't really work out. Uh, his limited experience there didn't really it didn't really end well for him. Um, so I like, I think I like Jose De Leon to be more of a, uh, an innings eater, maybe an opener if they decide to go that route, um, if they don't upgrade their bolt or their rotation um, and want to kind of back it up. So I think it's possible you could do that. Um, but, but generally just a, uh, a middle, middle of the, the bullpen kind of guy to go out there and eat some innings when they needed to. Yeah, there's going to be some – there will definitely be some competition in the Reds' bullpen during spring training. Um, I noticed that there are a lot of young guys projected to come up yeah. through the way – or through the system to make their way on the team. So there are – the bullpen is pretty open uh, in some in some aspects. I also have Amir Garrett right now as the closer. Uh, not too long ago, he was a starter for them. Uh, didn't quite work out, but he's been really mm-hmm. dominant in the bullpen for them. Um so I've got him as the closer right now. Lucas Sims, uh, I know Fangraph says that he has an elbow injury. I'm not mm-hmm. really sure what his recovery is looking like, but based on what Fangraph says, it looks like he will be ready for opening day unless okay. if there is some kind of setback with him. So I do have him 
in the back end of the rotation right now. I like him as maybe a seventh inning guy, maybe even an eighth inning guy. Um, John Doolittle, this, this signing was a little surprising to me when the Reds, when the Reds picked him up Um, to me, it kind of, I I don't know if this necessarily improves the bullpen. I think it just kind of adds reinforcement to the bullpen. Uh, Doolittle has closing capabilities though. The thing that concerns me though, is he has had, uh, he has an injury history. Um, He it's pretty common to see him land on the IL um, at least once a year, uh, whether it be for 10 days or for two months um, that I do have a little concern about, about that. Um, but I think he'll be a good back into the bullpen piece. I think he could even be the closer on opening day, depending on how the Reds feel about Garrett being the, the regular closer. Uh, Cam Bedrosian, like you said, he signed with the team yesterday. Um, I like him as a good seventh inning guy. It wasn't too long ago. Bedrosian had, was one of the top yeah. relievers in the league too. Um, yeah. So I, I'm hoping that he can kind of have a resurgence again and find that groove that he had with the angels not too long ago. Uh, Jeff Hoffman. I am, I am really excited to see how he does away from Coors Field. Uh, mm-hmm. Hoffman was a very highly touted prospect in the Rocky system. It just never worked out. Uh, they tried him in the rotation. He couldn't really get consistency in the rotation. They tried him in the bullpen. It seemed like he got worse going to the mm-hmm. bullpen. They tried to send him down to AAA. It just was not – everything they were doing just wasn't working. Um, so the Reds took a gamble. They traded for him. They brought him in. Uh, I think a change of scenery, being in a new ballpark, I think is going to help Hoffman a lot. And Hoffman does have starting capabilities still. I could see yep. him being kind of like an emergency starter, um, maybe even be the number five if yeah, it's if possible. Lorenzen, yeah, if Lorenzen doesn't work out and they need to move him back to the bullpen, I could see Hoffman going to the rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm rooting for him. I hope he has a good year uh in Cincinnati I hope he can find himself and kind of rediscover himself again uh no Ramirez they also got him from the Angels I've got him in the bullpen Sal Romano Romano was a starter at one time as well I mm-hmm. think he's done with those days though yeah. and then one guy I think will be in the who will be in the bullpen on opening day is one of their top prospects Ryan Hendricks uh Hendricks is the team's number 21 prospect he had a brief stint with the club last year did very well uh I like his chances of being in the opening day bullpen um maybe more so over guys like TJ Antone and Jose mm-hmm. DeLeon right now um but we'll see. I, again, the Reds bullpen is kind of up for grabs. There are spots that are going to be available for some of these young guys. I really like Hendricks to start the year off in the bullpen, um, you know, being one of their top prospects and kind of getting near the end of like being a prospect. So say, I believe he's 23. So um, he's a little, he's a, getting a little bit on the older side as far as prospects go, but mm-hmm. I will, I'm, kind of excited to see how things look um for his future and uh, i hope that he can make that opening day bullpen i think he'll be a good piece for them whether it's uh, as a setup man or whether it's maybe to just eat up a couple innings at a time um mm-hmm. if, depending on how starting pitching goes yeah yeah either either way um i'm not too wild by their bullpen uh it, it seems to be I would say slightly below average. Um, Amir Garrett, Sean Doolittle, we we both know at this point kind of what those guys are. Um, The rest of their bullpen and, you know, either way you look at it is kind of made up of guys who have had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Uh, Jeff Hoffman in Colorado, No Ramirez in Cam Bedrosian um, in Los Angeles. I think No Ramirez was a Red Sox at one point too. and then you have, you know, uh, unproven guys like TJ Antoine, uh, Sal Romano, Jose De Leon. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, which of those guys can kind of prove that they belong uh, for the club this season. Yeah, I think the bullpen is just slightly better than the rotation. Yes. But yep. um, things can quickly fall apart, too. Uh, they do have some guys with injury history here that it could play a part. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it's kind of it's just kind of a statement to how things have gone for the Reds this offseason. They've been a little more, you like you said, side to side, kind of taking a step back, not really majorly improved, but they haven't necessarily regressed either. It just kind of feels like they're playing the budget 
right now and kind of bringing in anyone they can for reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, I think one, at least one or two of these guys um, should break out um, whether it be, you know, Bedros proving that, you know, he is actually uh, a reliable, consistent bullpen piece or whether it be one of the young guys we listed kind of breaking out like Amir Garrett did a couple seasons ago. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, it's definitely a, a bullpen worth watching to see kind of who turns into that guy. Absolutely. All right. Looking at, uh, looking at their prospects, um, kind of, kind of top heavy for me. I didn't actually realize, I didn't realize that Austin Hendrick was their number three guy um, until I started looking him up just because he, he just got drafted. Um, but someone who people have kind of forgotten about in the past year and a half, two years, um, Hunter Green, Yeah, you know, entering, entering um, the MLB draft out of Notre Dame high school. Um, he was, he was looked at as like, uh, I don't know. He, he was, he was like Babe Ruth. Like he had, he was like, you know, he, he could hit for average, hit for power. He was great. A great fielder. He threw a hundred miles per hour and he had a filthy slider. Uh, people were, were clamoring to go after him. Everyone's like, this guy's already, the twins had the first pick in the draft that season. Everyone's like, this dude's a twin. Like he, he's going to get taken number one overall. There's no doubt about it. And then the twins took Royce Lewis with the first pick. Um, I mean, looking at it at the, you know, at least at this point, um, Royce Lewis is actually closer to the major leagues than Hunter Green is. That's true. Um, so, so they were maybe looking for more immediate talent rather than um, a longer term guy like Hunter Green. Um, although not entirely to Hunter Green's fault, uh, he was taken second overall that season by the Reds. Um, He's 21 years old now, uh, as, as you can see on the screen. He's the number two prospect for them. His 2017 and 2018 numbers really weren't that special. Um, he, he had like a, he had a 4.95 ERA across 21 starts in those two seasons. So really was still trying to figure himself out against, you know, some new competition. Um, he pitched to a 1.349 whip. So it, it, whip has a lot of uh, room for improvement. Um, 72.2 innings for reference. Uh, he played mostly in rookie ball in 2017, played in A ball in 2018. Uh, and before his 2019 season could even get underway, uh, he did have to go and get Tommy John surgery. Um, just another guy in a long list of, of uh, highly touted prospects, pitching prospects that can throw uh, insanely fast, needing Tommy John. Uh, you know, you look at guys like, um, Lucas Giolito, who's had to have it now. Um, they're the other Michael Kopech has had to have it now, uh, just to name two guys out of the list. Uh, but so obviously 2019 didn't happen for him. 2020 obviously didn't happen for him. So it'll be interesting to see where he is now uh, two, without two years of, of any sort of uh, pro ball. He's still he's still throwing 97 to 102 uh, from what I saw on MLB.com. Their scouting report for him, uh, as I mentioned, 97 to 102 on the fastball. Um, his slider is looking more and more like a potential plus for him. Um, it's looking like that could actually turn into uh, his out pitch, um, kind of his you know his strikeout pitch. Um, his changeup, as MLB.com said, is still behind the other two, but it is improving. Um, I, I do think it's possible he probably sees a mix of single A and double A this season, um, unless he absolutely blows up single A. He could reach as high as, as uh, triple A. Um, as we mentioned, he's 21, so he still has, you know, plenty of years uh, to figure this out. There's no reason to concern, you know, having missed two seasons. Um, and something that I was kind of thinking about is like if he fails to be kind of the 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 pitching prospect that they needed rather than moving him to the bullpen, they could almost, excuse me, turn him into an infielder. Mm. Um, if, if absolutely, you know, necessary. Um, I, I haven't heard anything about whether or not this is uh, potentially true or, you know, even a rumor, um, but just kind of my thoughts, you know, he's, he's only had 30 professional at bats. Um, he's a 233 hitter. So seven for 30 um, doesn't have any home runs, has a couple RBIs, but, 
as I mentioned, you know, this was a guy who was looked at as a superstar hitter before he got drafted. So I think it is potentially possible. You know, I, I don't think that he's just, you know, since being drafted, I don't think he's just gone away from trying to hit or trying to field or anything like that. I'm willing to bet on some of those backfields and spring training. Um, you'll probably see Hunter Green, uh, assuming that he, you know, uh, uh, makes the major league spring training roster. I don't think so. Um, I haven't seen their list, but I think he will be in the spring training complex. You might see him, as I said, on a backfield, probably uh, doing some T work and stuff like that, trying to keep the bat sharp. Um, it, it is possible he could be maybe a, a Dontrell Willis. Um, not, not to say that he's going to be a boss as a pitcher, but you know, Dontrell Willis was actually a really, really good hitter. Uh, Michael Lorenzen's on that list as well. Uh, Clayton Kershaw is even a, a semi-okay hitter for a pitcher um, and obviously Madison Bumgarner. So I think he could potentially potentially be a two-way player now that, you know, if you think about it, before he got drafted, we had never even, you know, considered a two-way player being a possibility since Bo Jackson. So I think it is possible that uh, now that Shohei Otani has kind of broken that door down, that we might actually see him kind of, you know, work his way back like that. Uh, being, you know, so that they can kind of monitor his innings um, and, and even get him some, some, you know, glove work in the field and some, some work in the plate. Uh, my second prospect is sitting right behind him in the prospect rankings, Austin Hendrick. Uh, Austin Hendrick was taken 12th overall in 2020. Uh, he's 19 years, he's a 19 year old outfielder. As I mentioned, the name looked familiar, but I did not realize he was just drafted this season, uh, last season now. Um, uh, he's a Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh native. Um, so that's always cool to see. Uh, he was actually viewed as one of the best prep, uh, players in the country. Um, he's at that one point in time viewed as the best prep player, uh, the past two summers. Uh, so there is that there is also some concern, uh, scouts are worried. I guess he kind of changed his approach at the plate, uh, kind of changed his, uh, his swing a little bit, uh, had scouts worried a little bit this past summer. Um, he started to kind of rise in his swing and miss rate. Um, but, but like I said, he's, he's got the best raw left-handed power in the class. That was from uh, what a scout said. Um, he's got plus hands and, and plus bat speed. So, you know, he's, he's got a quick, quick swing. Um, it's said that he has enough range to play center field, uh, but they believe that his tools will take him more towards right field. Uh, he does, as they mentioned, he does have the arm to play right field. So I think it is likely that you'll probably see him eventually switch over to right field if he doesn't, you know, immediately off the bat. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have any pro games. Baseball reference doesn't have any, any games for him at all. They don't, you know, really cover high school. Um, so as far as what to go off of um, to get drafted and immediately be your team's number three prospect. I think he's got a bright, bright future. Um, it is possible that he could see, he'll probably see rookie ball and maybe a mix of low a ball this season, um, depending on kind of how he does. But I think there's plenty to look forward to with him. Um, he's got, like I said, he's 19. So he's got like five years to kind of figure, figure this out. Um, and, and really um, get his feet under him and kind of hit the ground running. Uh, my next prospect isn't actually on their 30 man, their 30 man prospect list. Um, but I thought it was interesting to cover him. And this is uh, middle infielder Errol Robinson. Now Errol Robinson spent a lot of time in the Dodgers system. Um, and believe it or not, he uh, once upon a time was actually involved in the Manny Machado trade mm. Um he was he was one of the the prospects ventured along with guys like Dustin May, um, who was predicted to go to uh, uh, Baltimore in the Manny Machado trade with the Dodgers. I actually wrote a story uh, for Real Sport. I don't know if Real Sport took it down or not mm. by this point. Um, it you know, I, I won't even I won't even discuss Real Sport, but I, I actually did. It was like twelve thirty my time when the trade went down. So I, I spent the next like three hours trying to write it up, looking for any scraps of information. Um, like I mentioned, it did look like Dustin May was going to be the head of that that deal. It to think that he ended up not being a part of that deal, and the best player that the the uh, Orioles got was like Yusnel Diaz. Uh, it's a little unfortunate, 
I know that it was only for like half a season of Manny Machado, but I think the, the Orioles kind of got gypped a little bit there. But Eero Robinson, um, he was a, a sixth round draft pick in 2016. Uh, he's listed with, you know, semi okay speed, okay power. Um, he's a good fielder. Um, in 221 career double A games, he's a 266 hitter with 15 home runs and 30 stolen bases. Um, although uh, in 61 triple A games, he's only a 220 hitter with two home runs and two stolen bases. So he definitely still has to prove that he can play um, in triple A. He's 26. So, you know, this is kind of going to be a, prove it or move it deal uh, mm-hmm. for him this season. He's a, a non-roster invite to the Reds uh, spring training camp. So it'll be interesting to see uh, whether or not he can kind of uh, turn back into to the guy that the, the Orioles almost traded for um, or not. Yeah, that's a, that's a good prospects line for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I've noticed in my prospect reviews is I tend to go with the older guys yeah, in the yeah. system. Um, and to be completely honest, I'm not doing it on purpose. I just, I'm not, yeah, I'm I, not trying I, to pick I, young guys. Yeah, yeah. I just, I pick the older guys for some reason. Um, the first guy that I want to talk about is their number one prospect, Nick Lodolo and Lodolo, I believe he was drafted at a college. So he hasn't really had a ton of pro experience and even though he only has a handful of games so far, he hasn't been bad. He started in eight games. He's only zero and one. So it probably goes to show he's not, he, um, I think this is more, he's not really meeting the innings requirements mm-hmm. up to this point. He's only pitched 18 and a third innings. He has a 0.98 whip right now, 30 strikeouts in those 18 innings, okay. 2.45 ERA He's only allowed one Homer. He's a left-handed <laughs> pitcher, 23 years old. He's their number one guy. Um, so kind of like Austin Hendrick, this guy doesn't have a ton of experience, but considering, you know, as, as early as he was drafted and he's already the number one, I think there's a lot of high ceiling for him. Could see him on spring training roster this year, if not this year, next year. Uh, maybe even see him on the team as early as next year, uh, mm-hmm. I would imagine. The next guy I want to look at, and he's pictured below on my side, uh, their number 15 prospect, Riley O'Brien. He's a right-handed pitcher. He's 26 years old, and I believe that picture of him down there is from his high school days. Uh, in the minor leagues so far, he's kind of been – he's flipped around between bullpen and rotation. Uh, he's 16-10 and 10 in 56 games, 40 starts, 2.83 ERA across 232 innings pitched, uh, 250 strikeouts. So this guy can – he can get the strikeouts. His walk numbers are a little – um, concerning. He has 103 walks he's given up. The whip is at 1.15. So he will strike guys out, but he does allow base runners. Get this though. This is another thing I kind of look at when I'm doing like pitching prospects. I like to see kind of how they give up some of these runs. 11 home runs in 232 oh. innings pitched. 11 homers given up. That's like three days in a row that you've hit with guys that don't give up home runs. Yeah. And, it's, and I look at that and I'm like, no, well, no wonder this guy has a high ceiling. I mean, he mm-hmm. doesn't he doesn't give up full long balls. And again, I don't know how minor league ballparks work. I don't mm-hmm. know everything about them. So they could be maybe the ballparks play a factor. But I would imagine across several levels of minor league ball, he's only allowed 11 homers over 230 plus innings. I don't imagine that's all ballpark factor. I'm sure mm-hmm. there, I imagine there is stuff there. Um this is a guy I would look out for to maybe be on the team at some point this year, especially because he's older. Uh, he's not so much a prospect anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And if he doesn't make the team, I'd expect to see him as a trade piece if the Reds are trying to maybe improve immediately. Um, so one way or the other, if he doesn't make the Reds, this guy should be on a major league squad at some point this year. And then the last guy I want to take a look at, he's an outfielder, TJ Friedel. He's a number 19 prospect. He's 25 years old. Uh, 335 minor league games, 277 batting average, uh, 369 on base percentage. Uh, he kind of strikes out. Uh, he strikes out consistently. I wouldn't say he strikes out a lot because he has more games on his belt than he does strikeouts. Uh, mm-hmm. 260 strikeouts, but he does have 147 walks. Okay. So this guy's he's consistent. He gets he 
puts the ball in play. He gets on base. He'll strike out. He kind of is a well, he's as well-rounded as you can get. Uh, he has a 412 slugging percentage, 20 homers, 134 RBI. Um, this guy, I don't think has a ton of power in his bat, 20 homers across 335 games. That's mm-hmm. about, that's about 10 a season. If you put 162 in, it's about 10 a season. So uh, he's not the biggest of power hitters, but he will drive in runs. He will, he will hit for average. Um, I, I would expect to see this guy maybe get a call to spring training, maybe even make the opening day roster possibly. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to bank on it exactly, but those are my three prospects that I'd keep an eye on. And again, Friedel and O'Brien much older. They're, they're a lot older, um, but they seem very well-rounded. And I think those are two guys that Reds fans should keep an eye out for. Um, if not on opening day roster, look for them to possibly be on the team at some point this year. Mm-hmm. Now, just to kind of stress this, um, neither of us really do any communicating when it comes to putting our teams together <laughs> and doing our prospects. I'm just glad that we haven't ran into the same prospect. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if, <clears throat> cause usually, usually we just, you know, up until we started doing um, uh, our PowerPoint, we actually would just like do it on the fly. Like we didn't actually know who the other was going to do until we, you know, said it. So it's really nice to know that we haven't you know, picked the same prospect um, at, at some point. At this point. Yeah. I think, I think we've got a little, uh, I think we've got a little uh, chemistry going there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, kind of looking right before I, I do this, I want to talk quickly about um, some of their pitching stats from this past season. Okay. Um, I, I totally, I forgot to go over it. Um, they finished second in ERA in the National League, uh, which really stuck out to me. Um, they've always been a good ERA uh, team. They've been a good pitching team. Uh, they also finished second in hits allowed and home runs allowed. Um, obviously, I know that Trevor Bauer is gone now, but I do think it is worth noting. Um, they finished first in complete games with three, obviously in a 162-game season. Um, maybe not maybe three won't, wouldn't be the um, major league lead. Um, they finished first in strikeouts with 615. Um, so just, just a couple pitching stats that I wanted to cover quickly uh, before we got to their projections, but looking at, Oh, go ahead. That's good for their ballpark. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I've kind of gotten to the point now where I want to try to find some extra stats just to, just to give a little extra life into to how my projections roll out. Um, looking at my projections, looks like we're, we're not too far off. Um, I have a floor of 76 and 86 for the Reds. Um, this is assuming that the rotation is as feared, um, and it's not, not very competitive outside of, uh, Castillo and Gray. Uh, maybe Lorenzen is kind of more suited as a relief pitcher. Maybe Wade Miley, um, you know, as, as has happened in his career, maybe he's not as effective as, as they hope. Um, and they don't go out and acquire guys. So they're kind of left trying to patchwork a rotation together. Um, I think that could lead to a floor of 76 wins, uh, probably puts them in fourth place in the division. Uh, at the same time, I think they have a ceiling of 92 and 70. Uh, this is assuming the opposite happens to their bullpen or to their rotation. Uh, Sonny Gray and Luis Castillo have, you know, 10 plus win seasons. Uh, both pitch, you know, 30 starts, you know, put up close to 200 innings um, and, you know, have sub three ERAs. uh, And then they can kind of work it out, whether it be Wade Miley kind of continues his magic he had in in Milwaukee. Uh, Maybe Michael Lorenzen's a full-time starter now and he can get you, you know, 20 to 25 starts. Um, So I think that is possible. Obviously, their batting average needs to come up quite a bit as a team. Um, I think that would contribute into the 92 win projection. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think they'll, they'll finish somewhere between fourth and second place in, in this division. I agree with that. Um, fourth and second between second and fourth seems like a good, I don't know if they're a division winning team. Um, yeah, yeah. The thing for me, if they're going to win the division, everything has to, 
Yeah. They, they have to be good on offense. They have to be good on pitching. The bullpen yeah. has to be good. Uh, I've got a floor of 74 and 88 right now. And it's really because I'm just not, I'm not sold on this team. Like I was last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a lot of flaws that could take place. Uh, but I think 86 and 76 is a good ceiling for them. And that's if, as if everything goes well for this team, like their, their bullpen is solid. Their rotation outside of gray and Castillo uh, is lights out. Well, not necessarily lights out, but at least consistent enough to get them five Mm -hmm. to six innings a day, a game. Um, And then the offense needs to improve. Obviously they need to get away from the hit, the all, the all or nothing mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, this division is very much up for grabs. Anything can happen. I think this team can, be a sneaky sleepwalking team that could get to the playoffs. But for me, if they're going to get there, they need to improve. They need to improve at least in the pitching uh, bullpen and rotation. I think their offense is fine. They just need to get away from that all or nothing mentality. Um, But if they can improve the rotation and improve and maybe even do a little improvement in the bullpen, um, I think this team will be on more of the ceiling than they will the floor. But if they can't really make those reinforcements happen, um, I'm not really sure this team is going to be all that competitive by the end of the mm-hmm. season. Uh, I will note if, if they wear the uniform, remember the uniforms they wore a couple of years ago, um, primarily Derek Dietrich, where they had the cutoff shirts and they wore like like shorts. Oh, almost. It was just it was basically the. Um, like the the vest without the yeah. sleeves yeah if, if if they wear those they're going 162 and 0 so if <laughs> if someone with the red sees this make those your i want to i would love I, i'm a sucker for those vest jerseys i don't know why it is um just the the sleeveless you know like when colorado wore those kind of like yeah. the matt holiday troy to era um uh, the Pirates wore it and kind of like the, the Ian Snell, uh, Zach Duke, Jason Bay era. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is, but I've always liked um, the cutoff, cutoff sleeves on the jerseys and then like a, a shirt underneath. That was the year they were celebrating like a hundred years or something like that as a franchise. Yeah. And they were, they were sporting all the old school uniforms. Mm-hmm. It was cool. I, I, I liked that they did that. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are, those were days for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've reached that point in time again. Uh, you can always find us on our, our social medias. I have not posted a TikTok video yet. I'm trying to figure out um, when is a good time. I have a ring light that I want to try to get. Um, that's that's not at my house right now. So I'll have to, I'll have to grab that. Uh, but soon. And once I get a video up, we will have that posted here. Uh, but as always, you can find us on Facebook at Dugout Talk. Our, our username is at Real Dugout Talk. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at, at Dugout Talk One. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Real Dugout Talk. And obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you know you can find us. Just search Dugout Talk. We're usually the first thing that pops up. Um, with that said, uh, it's another episode in the books. Um, who, we got what the Cubs next, and then uh, it's actually the Cardinals tomorrow. Cardinals Cubs, okay. yeah. Cardinals okay. Cubs. Uh, Cardinals should be fun. They had a <laughs> they had a yeah. they had a heck of an off season. I am, yeah. uh, you know, it's always the Cardinals are a very just a quick note. They're a very well respected team. I, I think to me, they're the best fans in baseball. That's just my that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, um, yeah I've never I've never so. talked to a Cardinals fan who just didn't have a general appreciation for the game, and they mm-hmm. have just a general respect for other teams as well. Yep. Maybe not so much Cubs fans, but yeah, yeah no. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, you know. Uh, being a fan uh, being in the Yankee fan base it's tough yeah. because <laughs> a lot of times I end up fighting with other Yankee fans because you know it's it's you know fire Aaron Boone fire Brian Cashman trade Aaron Judge trade John Carlos Stanton you know they they Yankee fans are insufferable to say the least um, but yeah, uh, we got Cardinals tomorrow. Uh, if you've lived under a rock for the past two months, uh, there's a special someone who uh, will be included in that episode, a special third baseman. Um, it's it's going to be tough covering the Rockies, uh, I will yeah. have to say, because, uh, yeah. you know, they were kind of the let's let's trade you our best player 
for low low level prospects and we're also going to give you 50 million dollars just to kind of sweeten the pot but uh yeah with that said another episode of dugout talks is in the books uh we'll be back tomorrow same time same place um yeah yeah it's it's appreciate you guys uh coming to watch us again uh and hope we get to see you guys again tomorrow see you guys see you